Welcome to the Celebrity Estates Wills of the Rich and Famous podcast. In this podcast, we break down high profile celebrity estate planning cases for advisors and their clients. Most celebrity estate catastrophes are based on the same issues that everyday people face, just with the volume turned up. Our goal is to identify and extract the individual estate planning issues that lie at the heart of each story. We then discuss what advisors should expect and how to avoid common pitfalls. Hosted by WealthManagement.com Senior Editor David Lenock. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the latest episode of WealthManagement.com's Celebrity Estates, Wills of the Rich and Famous. For anyone new to the podcast, in each installment, myself and a guest take on a different celebrity estate and attempt to extract some key lessons that planners can apply to their more traditional clients. The idea being that celebrity estate planning stories, although often ridiculous in their details, generally have at their cores very basic issues that can just as easily apply to non-famous or fabulously wealthy clients. We're once again joined this week by our favorite guest, Megan Gorman. Megan is the founding partner of Checkers Financial Management. It's a fee-only planning firm that specializes in high net worth and ultra high net worth families in San Francisco, California. Checkers focuses on establishing long-term relationships with families and helps them navigate through tax, estate, liquidity, and investment planning. And Megan heads the firm's family office services practice. She's also a senior contributor for Forbes in personal finance and tax and quoted regularly in the press as a tax and financial planning expert, including such publications as the Wall Street Journal, the Washington Post, and CNBC, among others. She regularly blogs at www.thewealthintersection.com and has appeared on numerous podcasts, including this one and is a regular weekly commentator on the Money Tree podcast. Finally, she's also on the board of trustees for the National Endowment for Financial Education and is an adjunct professor of law at Golden Gate Law School. It is great to have you back on, Megan. Oh, thanks, David. I'm thrilled to be back on and discussing one of my favorite areas of estate planning, the holographic will. Absolutely. The subject of this, in case you couldn't guess from the holographic will comment, uh, our subject this week is Larry King. Um, King was a highly visible radio and television news host for some 70 years. He's best known for his long-running nightly interview show on CNN, Larry King Live. He's second best known for being married eight times to seven different women, which unsurprisingly plays a central role in the estate planning story we're going to talk about today. King sadly passed away at the end of January at age 87 after a battle with COVID-19. At the time of his death, King was in the midst of a divorce from his seventh wife, Sean King. According to Sean, the former couple had an estate plan in place that they wrote when they were still together in 2015. Last month, however, reports emerged of a holographic will that Larry wrote in October 2019, two months after filing for divorce. According to the Los Angeles Times, the handwritten will leaves his estate to his five children, two of whom died in 2020, and omits Sean completely. Now, this news obviously didn't sit well with Sean, who's contesting the will's validity as well as contesting Larry King Jr.'s, who's King's son from a different marriage, emergency move to become a special administrator of the estate. According to Sean's filings, King split from Larry Jr.'s mother before Larry Jr. was born. She states that King has never met his son until the latter was well into his 30s, and that he'd previously been completely unaware of Larry Jr.'s existence. And I quote, Petitioner has never been involved in Larry's career or business, and it would be highly inappropriate to place him in a position of representing Larry's estate her filing states. So Megan, there's quite a bit here that should sound pretty familiar to avid listeners of our show in terms of the impact of divorce and the complexly blended families on estate plans. But the one of the unique aspects here is the question of the handwritten will. So let's start there. What exactly yeah. is a holographic will? Yeah, to your point, this is a multi-layered case. And I think we really need to peel back each layer of the onion. So a holographic will is essentially a handwritten and unwitnessed will. And holographic wills are not new. They go back to, you know, way back to Roman times um, when soldiers would draft holographic wills before going into battle. And so they've always sort of been an element of estate planning. And what's interesting about holographic wills is that here in the United States, while they are permissible, they are not permissible in every state. So when you start to go down the path of understanding a holographic will, you really need to understand 
is the state in which the holograph wi holographic will occurred a state that recognizes holographic wills? And in this case, Larry King passed away in the great state of California that I'm based in, and California does allow a holographic will. Now, what's unique here is that California's requirements for a holographic will are pretty straightforward. The holographic will must show that the person who drafted it, in this case, Larry King, had testamentary capacity. They must have been of sound mind when writing the will and understood they were writing the will. The will had to have been in their own handwriting or if it was a form, it had to have had some of the handwriting in the blanks of the form. And the will had to have been signed. And in most holographic wills, they prefer the signature to be at the bottom of the will. So interestingly enough, with a holographic will, California does not require witnesses, nor do they require a notary to sign it. So if you think about it from a practitioner standpoint, we always need to be thinking about making sure with a holographic will that it has the ability to be seen as valid. And so some of the nuances here is if we take the California requirements and apply them to the King case, we had someone who was on in their years. Now, he was still very active. He never retired, but he had had some health struggles. So some of the things they're going to look at probably is, was he of sound mind? And you're already starting to see in the press his estranged wife, uh, Sean King, bringing up concerns of fraud. And this might not have been what Larry wanted. And the other thing you're going to see them focus on is, was this really meant to be part of the estate plan? Was there testamentary intent? And I say that because we always have to be careful that if someone writes a letter, right, or if they draft something in writing, were they intending that to be part of their last will and testament? And so that's going to be some of the nuances we deal with right out of the gate. It's really interesting that you mentioned the, the soldiers at war thing, because at least in New York, you can still see that because New York, one of the few places where holographic wills are still allowed, and in a number of other states as well, is, you know, people active military service. And I believe also like sailors who are about to go out, not sailors, like any sort of, uh, you know, ship workers who are about to go out on long journeys at sea are like two mm -hmm. of the only exceptions that allow for holographic wills. Um, yep. But you also brought up, you know, these two very key, sort of keystones of estate planning um, in these ideas, the twin ideas of testamentary capacity and testamentary intent. And um, these are sort of will come up in every estate planning context, not just holographic wills. And they're very sort of important to, to understand the, you know, testamentary intent and is sort of the best interest of the child of, of estate planning. It's, just, it's what that is to family law, or sort of the catch all of, okay, well, this is the first thing that we need to argue about. Exactly. You know, when I, one of the things I, I enjoy is really understanding how we've gotten to establish things like testamentary intent. And there's a great case from the 1940s that I always talk about when explaining holographic wills. And David, as an attorney, you probably know this case, but it was about a Canadian farmer named Cecil George Harris, who goes out for the day to ride his tractor. And as he's leaving the house, he says to his wife, don't expect me for hours. I'm going to be out there for 10 to 12 hours. And while he's out there, he somehow gets into an accident with the tractor and gets trapped under the tractor. And he knew he was in trouble. He knew that his injuries were life-threatening. And so he wanted to protect his wife in case, uh, she in case he died. And so what he did in that case is he took out his pocket knife and he etched into his tractor fender a will. And that will basically said, in case I die in this mess, I leave all to the wife, Cecil Geo Harris. And he does die eventually. And they find the fender and they submit it to the probate court. And I'm telling you this story because what that story truly illustrates is this person understood that this was his last will. He displays testamentary intent and he writes it down and he signs it.
Now, in Larry King's case, we don't have a tractor fender involved. Um, we, we don't actually know what the document looks like. But what we're probably going to be scrutinizing once more details come into play is, does he display that intent to make this his last will and testament? And one of the things I struggle with in this story, and I think, David, you probably do as well, is, you know, when you're dealing with estate planning, attorneys have a whole toolbox, right, of things that we can do. And this was a man who had filed for divorce from Sean King. They had been married, I believe, in 1997, filed for divorce in 2018, 2019, and he wrote the holographic will in 2019. But Larry King was a man who had substantial assets. Some estimates by the press have his estate worth over $100 million. And so when you have this sizable asset base and you're going through a divorce, and then on top of that, you're sitting in a state like California, did, did Larry make the best choices in regards to what was available to him? And that's one of the things I think we have to work through here. Yeah, I think uh, to summarize, I guess, what you're saying is that it, for someone who's still active and still able to get around and who's obviously no stranger to the legal system and clearly has advisors and lawyers and, and is, is fine with interacting with the system, it seems odd that mm -hmm. this is how, especially considering he already has an estate plan in place which had been done, you know, sort of quote unquote properly. Um, it just seems odd that he would, would take this handwritten, like very shorthand route to, to going about these things. Right. But David, I'm going to point out, you know, we, we take our clients as they are and we have to, you know, we, we assume once someone, if someone's wealthy and famous, that they have their financial house in order. But if you go back and look over the course of Larry King's life, he wasn't the most financially astute. I believe he's filed for bankruptcy, had creditor issues early in his life. And to be candid, you know, he, he married multiple times, right? So that's not often, you know, it, it, unless you're doing it with prenups or postnups, that might not be the best financial decisions. So one of the things that comes to mind here, which makes me think that the holographic will was his intent, was he seemed to do what he wanted to do financially. Um, and that he might have just thought this was a good idea. Yeah, and it's really interesting. You know, we've seen, you know, at least for in the last several years, a couple of, of high-profile holographic wills. Um, we've had Aretha Franklin's, and uh, we very recently had uh, Zappos founder Tony Siez, which was just mm -hmm. a series of post-it notes, sort of crazily posted around his house, sort of like a a homeland situation, if you will. And um, you know, in those cases it was either that or intestacy. So mm -hmm. when you're looking at testimony, it's like, well, this is all we have to work with. In this case, there was a previous estate plan. So how does that work then? What, what's, I guess, the proper way to sort of, you know, the unassailable way to, to change an existing estate plan? And, and how does that interact with this idea of holographic growth? Yeah. So, I mean, I think the thing is we should talk about what Larry should have done first, right? Yeah. In a perfect world, because this is California, California is one of the states that lets you change your estate plan before your divorce is finalized. So in a perfect world, Larry would have taken that step. So he didn't hear. So I think what we have to figure out first is, was the holographic will valid? Now, I mentioned the elements of the holographic will, testamentary uh, mindset, testamentary intent, and a valid signature. And so when those things are present, then what it becomes is the slippery slope argument of was somebody of unduly influenced or did they fraud? Did somebody commit fraud in encouraging him to do the holographic will? So I think in any sort of review of this, the, the validity of the holographic will will have to be reviewed. Now, you know, courts do not like to take away the ability of the deceased's right to pass on assets, right? So, you know, the court is going to look at this, but they're also going to look and see, does the holographic will cover the entire estate? And I say this because there have been some conflicting reports in the press that the holographic will only covers two million dollars of his estate which could lead us to believe that the rest of the assets might have been held in trust so that's not clear here 
Now we can tell from what his estranged wife is saying, she is trying to put forth in the press this idea of fraud, that this was some, he would never have done this. We have a watertight estate plan. This was not what Larry would have done. Um, and you're seeing that commentary. So you can see the argument being formed here that the holographic will was not permissible. So I think what you're gonna see is a debate over whether the will was valid and then whether the will, would, if it is valid, does it cover all of the assets or does, does it just cover a certain amount? Now, I wanna bring up something else here because I think one of the more challenging aspects in Larry's case is the idea that he is based in California. And I can tell you as a Californian, we all know it's a community property state. So unless you have partitioned out an asset, everything in California is, con is considered to be transmuted into community property. So for instance, if I own a house in my name and I haven't partitioned it out, it presumably is half owned by my husband as community property. So one of the things I see challenging in this case is Larry didn't revoke his existing estate plan during the divorce. And so what happens here is in a community property state, if you don't change your estate plan, what's going to happen here is even though they were working on splitting up the assets in a divorce, it was a community property asset base. So his estranged wife will likely get more under California law than, than she would have previously. Um, and that's a big deal. That was a lot of risk that he exposed himself to. And so that's one of the sort of the, the more challenging aspects of this case. Yeah. And just to clarify for our you know, non-attorney listeners, the other option, you know, for, whereas community property sort of works under the assumption that in the marriage you know, everything gets lumped into one pile and, and it's sort of half owned unless specifically excluded. Um, the other is separate property, which is you just kind of keep what you came in with. And then what happens together may or may not be, you know, it depends on whose name is on it and these sorts of things. But, you know, community property, you're working under the assumption that they both own this. And then you have to, you know, the burden is on one party to prove that no, this was specifically excluded or you know, or through some sort of negotiation to, as, as Megan said, partition it out. Exactly. And I think that's, that's one of these things, because when you think what's going to happen here, under California's community property laws, unless we had a prenup or a postnup stating otherwise, the estranged wife is entitled to receive 50% of marital assets acquired during marriage, regardless of what the estate plan would leave her. And so we get into this tricky area because if you think about it, Larry was divorcing this woman. The divorce was getting contentious. We were, you know, we had seen it in the press. And he probably, if he had gotten the divorce done, she would have gotten a, a lot less. Now, she did have kids with Larry. So presumably, some of the assets she will inherit from him will pass to her two children that she had with Larry. But I think that the takeaway that I have here is, you know, first of all, if you're getting divorced, you want to understand what's going on with your estate plan in the state in which you're divorcing. As I said, California allows you to change your estate plan before. And then I think what you want to also understand is, you know, as you're doing this, what works well with the state in which you reside. And I bring this up because in California, we don't like wills. And I don't want to say we don't like wills, but we typically use wills from a pour over perspective, in the sense of if I left anything outside of a revocable trust, you can use my will to pour it into my revocable trust. But anything that's left outside and the asset base exceeds um, a certain amount, then you will have to go through the probate system. So you want to make sure that any changes you make, even if you're going down the holographic will path, actually works with the efficiency inside your state's estate tax rules. Yeah, because I think a lot of you know, people's reasoning for when they do make holographic wills, um, putting aside sort of just lack of legal knowledge of the, the, the way to actually do it, is that it seems easier and quicker. And it seems like, oh, this should be fine. Um, but as we're seeing in sort of the, all the reading of the tea leaves that we're now trying to do in the postscript of his life, that it actually, will often create more problems because now we're trying to figure out 
you know, about someone who's not here, testamentary intent, and what was his capacity like, and oh, oh, now there's this son in the picture who just popped up, you know, what was, what was their relationship like, and we're, we're having to do a little bit of he said, she said, basically, and decide who we believe more, without ever actually mm -hmm. being able to ask Larry, um, which is something that had the will been, you know, done through the proper channels or through a revo revocable trust, it, you know, these, a lot of these questions would have been answered before they ever came up. And one of the things I think is interesting is when you study the history of holographic wills, you know, they, they, th there's a charm to them, but the legal community is split, right? And I think it's split because there's clearly a danger to do it yourself, right? They have found in studying modern holographic wills that most of the times they, the drafter omits um, a representative and they do not do a good, a strong enough job on the residual disposition of the residuary estate. But, and, and like we're seeing in the King case, there can often be claims of fraud or undue influence. But there is a small segment of academics who believe that holographic wills are a positive thing in, in the legal community. And that is because Americans are loath to do an estate plan. I believe, you know, that I think there's 42% of Americans actually have an estate plan in this country. And so by normalizing a holographic will process, we may get more people, particularly regular people, right? Not like Larry King, who has a nine figure estate, but just regular people to start to put their testamentary intent down on paper. And what they have found in studying these holographic wills is they do have a particular charm because when you read a regular estate plan, it's very legally, very dry, straightforward, right? And then when you look at these holographic wills, they often are a little more personalized. They have some storytelling to them. Um, and, and that's a nice thing. But we have to make sure that if you're going to do a holographic will, but you're going to cut people out of an estate or you know, you're going to take an aggressive position with your beneficiaries, you're probably better served doing that with an attorney who can make sure there's the right provisions in there to protect you versus like the Cecil George Harris story where I told you where he was giving everything to his wife. So he felt pretty comfortable etching it onto the fender. Yeah, holographic wills really sit at this interesting middle ground of the interaction between sort of the law and technology where, I mean, generally... Just in general, the law lags behind technology just necessarily. That's just a way of things. Um, if things are invented faster, then you know, legislatures can get down and, and change the law. And then that's ignoring the fact that a lot of times the members of those legislatures are much older and, and just not really you know, the quickest to pick up on, on new technological things. So I think for some of our listeners, it might be a little you know, vexing, I guess, that you know, the idea that a handwritten will is odd or somehow you know, not the way it's done, right? Because I mean, in the movies, or, you know, when you picture a will, it's sort of like the unfurling of this, like, scroll, my last will and testament written, you know, with a fountain pen, you know, kind of thing. Or like, oh, that's a will. But, you know, really, like, we've progressed to the point where something that's not typewritten, and then sort of, you know, witnessed it is odd. And so it's, but, you know, obviously, we've also progressed past typewriter technology at this point. So, you know, holographic wills can both be this handwritten idea, but also, you know, looking forward, anything outside of the traditional like typewritten norm could also be considered a holographic will unless specifically, you know, sort of mentioned in the law. So, you know, at what point are we start worrying about hologram wills? And, you know, that sounds <laughs> silly, but that's what it is. Looking, you can look forward backward to this handwritten idea being not right, but then look forward to, well, what are the possibilities? There are so many different ways. What is my Twitter will? You know, there's all of these possibilities, different ways of communication that people are using where, you know, the sort of the law has to now reckon with this idea of, okay, well, what's holographic and what's, you know, considered by you know, the law to be kosher. Agreed, agreed. And I think, you know, to your point about technology, we've already, you know, the law will adapt, right? But there have been cases um, where, you know, the courts have found there to be a holographic will where someone has downloaded pre-printed forms, right, from one of those websites, and they fill in the forms with their handwriting and they sign it. And in those cases, they find that those wills will be a holographic will. 
Um, and that's an interesting thing because I think it's the law trying to keep up with technology. But when you go and look through case law, and I think this is going to be important with the Larry King case, is that over the course of time, courts have erred to protecting what the testator wanted to do if there was intent involved in the drafting. And that's really important because we want people to control how their assets pass. You know, I think in the case of Larry King, you know, it's unfortunate that someone with that much money and that much ability to work with some of the best estate planning attorneys didn't do the best job at passing on his estate. But, you know, it, it, it also shows you that I don't think he thought he was going to pass away. And I say that because beyond this holographic will, which he wrote in 2019, he had five children and two of them died in 2020. And then at the same time in 2020, before he passed away, he just signed a $5 million deal to create a podcast. So this was someone who dealing with their own death, their own demise, it was not in his frame of vision. Yeah, and that's really, I mean, that's the most common fact pattern of all, right? That, that underlying all estate planning is that, I mean, none of us for the most part with a very low, small percentage of us think we're going to die. And so in every, that's why in every estate plan, there's blind spots and, and there's holes because, you know, you're trying to create a document that's as airtight as you can while also projecting into an unknown future, you know? So, you know, except in the rare case, I guess, of you know, someone who maudlinly you know, commits suicide right after writing their, you know, estate plan, you can't really, con you don't have that control over when you go. No one's really, you know, writing their estate plan in anticipation of immediate death. So there's well, always I would some actually, period, I would actually know? argue with you on that. I will tell you when you watch human nature, right? I have found over the course of my career, there have been moments where we might've had the estate plan done, but it was stale or it needed to be updated. I have found someone being put in the hospital. Um, I, I have found over the course of my career, I've had a number of quote unquote deathbed signings where, you know, someone's been with a terminal disease, they keep putting it off doing the estate plan or signing the estate plan. And we get it done right before they pass. Um, and, you know, it's, I think it has to do with the psychology of an estate plan, right? People don't, some people do not want to sign it because they feel that's like signing their death warrant in a way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you're absolutely right. I mean, I misspoke their deathbed sort of signings are a very real thing. Although ironically also they're the sort of thing that a court will, if the will is challenged, will immediately raise their eyebrow at, just because you know you would think again that they're crystal clear in their in their intent that like oh well I'm I'm in immediate anticipation of my death I know what I'm doing, but in the same vein now this opens up these more questions of oh well who was influencing them and who was there and these sorts of things so you know there's always going to be blind spots in, in these things and and holographic wills you know, they, they sit at an interesting point in sort of adjusting these blind spots, as Megan has, I think, very adroitly pointed out this idea of, you know, the convenience and, and the very personal nature of estate plans, which I mean, is, is, you know, it sounds silly to think about charm and personality in a legal document, but that, that's not something that should be discounted. It should be, you know, in, in the estate planning context, because when you're trying to guess intent and when you're trying to guess what the person may have wanted and, and discern these things, then charm and personality are important and having it in the document can help in a way in as much as it hurts having the document be sort of less legally strict. Exactly. Exactly. So, you know, I still would encourage everybody to get a proper estate plan done by an attorney because the, the nuance is important. But again, you know, if, if this is the only way to get you to get in test, testamentary intent down on paper, it makes sense. In the case of Larry King, Poor choices, poor planning, in my, in my point of view. And that's about all the time we have for today, folks. I'd like to thank, once again, Megan Gorman for being a fantastic guest. Oh, thanks for having me. And I look forward to seeing how this case plays out. I don't think this is done yet. Oh, no, not by a long shot. I think you're absolutely right. And for we'll all, all of our listeners- have a follow-up at some point. Yeah, absolutely. I'll see you, or I guess you'll hear me on the next episode of Celebrity Estates, Wills of the Rich and Famous. Thank you for listening to the Celebrity Estates Wills of the Rich and Famous podcast. Click the subscribe button below to become notified when new episodes become available.
The information covered and posted represents the views and opinions of the guests and does not necessarily represent the views or opinions of InformaWealthManagement.com. The content has been made available for informational and educational purposes only. The content is not intended to be a substitute for professional investing advice. Always seek the advice of your financial advisor or other qualified financial service provider with any questions you may have regarding your investment planning.